Ah, so new month here, new theme. So our theme for 2023 is building a community, and each month we have chosen a quality that supports that. And for the month of August, we are working with the quality of wholeness. Now, wholeness is one of those ideas that um, Ernest Holmes speaks about a lot, frequently in his, uh, in his writings. In fact, I, I have a document that has many quotes from his. It's about a 500-page document, and um, there were over 300 references to wholeness just in the quotes that were listed in that uh, document. But this is one that he says, and it shows up in at least five different books. Each individual life is a unique expression of the universal wholeness. So each one of us is that place that spirit shows up here. And we know that spirit is wholeness. Spirit is, is complete within itself. And there is um, nothing liking, lacking. There's no, um, nothing that's out of integrity, nothing that isn't congruent with the rest of it. And so this wholeness, this idea of wholeness, exists in that universal concept in spirit. And then it shows up in each one of our own individual lives as the wholeness that we are. When we arrive in this plane of existence, we are 100% whole and complete right there. Everything that we ever need is already within us. Everything that we could ever become is already within us. We are complete and whole. How many of you experienced any time in your life when you didn't quite feel whole? <laughs> we arrive in a state of wholeness, and then life happens. And life happens around us. And as life happens around us, we start to make decisions based on the things that happen. Like right from the very moment we are born, our little bodies start to make decisions about how life is for us. And each one of those decisions starts to chip away at this feeling of wholeness to where we don't, we don't always feel that in our lives. The wholeness is complete there. It's always there. But all of this stuff gets layered onto it to where we begin to forget our idea of wholeness. Life happens around us and we begin to feel anything but whole. We forget that we came as this complete package in the beginning. And then we start to develop behaviors to compensate for that feeling of anything but wholeness. And some of these behaviors then increase our sense of being less than whole, being divided, having a, a life that isn't quite what we thought it should be. And what happens within us then is we begin to feel incongruent with our inner expression and our outer expression. We start to feel like, I don't quite fit in. Or there's something wrong with me because I'm not feeling right in this place. You know, I do a lot of work um, around ideas of shame and guilt. And um, read a, I read a lot about it and so forth. And you know, this idea of guilt is um, that I did something wrong. But the idea of shame is I am wrong. Something fundamentally about me is wrong. And shame is built when we chip away at our wholeness, when we begin to hide our true nature, when we begin to cover it up with all of the coping mechanisms and, and things that we adapt to make us feel okay in the world when we're not feeling congruent on the inside and the outside. And all of that builds into this feeling of shame, this feeling like I am somehow fundamentally flawed, that there's something about me that isn't right. And that's the feeling of shame that I think permeates so much of, the, of our world. So many people are caught up in this um, unspoken, unexplored feelings of shame and inadequacy because we have forgotten our wholeness. We have forgotten that we came here as this complete and perfect vessel. We've forgotten that spirit doesn't make mistakes. It didn't make a mistake with us. There's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing that we should even have any sense of shame about because we came in here perfect, whole, and complete. And yet we've experienced things in our lives that show up about that. So some of the things, um, one of the books I'm reading is um, a book called The Hidden Wholeness by Parker Palmer phenomenal book. Um, 
And in this, he talks about some of the ways that this um, dividedness shows up in our lives. And so some of the things are, we, we, uh, he says, we sense something missing in our lives, and we search the world for it. Not understanding what is missing is actually us, is our true nature. We're looking for something to bring into our lives because there's, there's this void within us that we feel. And that void is that we're not expressing our true nature, our true self. We feel fraudulent or maybe invisible to the world around us because we don't feel like the world actually sees who we are. We project our inner darkness on others, making enemies out of them and making the world feel like a more dangerous place. It's um, our tendency to find someone to attribute um, fault to for all the problems in the world. Um, this, this happens a lot in our political system where the people are looking for somebody to blame. Let me tell you who's, who's responsible for your feelings and, um, and we'll blame them for it because, of course, it couldn't be us. So we're looking to make enemies of people outside of ourselves. Um, this authenticity that we feel inside and the way that we project it outside actually makes it difficult for us to establish really good, meaningful relationships, which often leads to feeling lonely. And the things that we're able to do for the world, the contributions that we're able to do in the world, even if others are telling us these are great things that you're doing in the world, often inside is an internal feeling of deception. You know, somebody can tell me how wonderful I, something is that I've done, but if I don't feel it inside myself, I feel like a fraud. And makes it hard to accept the praise then as it comes in. This, uh, this idea of getting back to our true self. True self is, is called lots of things in lots of different uh, religious traditions. In, in Buddhism, it is called the true self, um, our highest self. Um, in um, many religions, it's called the soul. It is that nature, that true nature of who we are, who we came here, that perfect being that came here, that arrived on this planet, whole and complete. That's our true self. That's our soul. Parker Palmer has the best description of a soul that I've ever read. I'm going to share it with you. He says, like a wild animal, the soul is tough, resilient, resourceful, savvy, and self-sufficient. It knows how to survive in hard places. Yet, despite its toughness, the soul is also shy. Just like a wild animal, it seeks safety in the dense underbrush, especially when other people are around. If we want to see a wild animal, we know that the last thing we should do is go crashing through the woods, yelling for it to come out. But if we would walk quietly into the woods, sit patiently at the base of a tree, breathe with the earth, and fade into our surroundings, the wild creature we seek just might put in an appearance. We may only seek it, see it briefly and only out of the corner of our eye, but the sight is a gift we will treasure forever. To find our true self, to find that, that true nature of who and what we are, we have to be quiet. We have to listen. This is where our practices of meditation and contemplation come in. We have to go within. We have to listen. We have to be still enough for that shy soul to make itself known. To find our true nature takes us being still enough to hear it. That's one part of it. The second part of it is that we are not meant to be solitary creatures. Human beings are communal. They're social animals. We are meant to be in groups with other people. Sometimes it's hard to be in a group and find silence at the same time. But there are ways that we can begin to do this. And our center is perfectly primed to do just that. 
creating circles, creating groups where we can be still enough to hear our soul, where we have enough trust in the people around us that they aren't going to go crashing through the underbrush trying to dig us up. When we come together in groups, in community, together of like-minded people, we build what, are, what um, Parker Palmer calls circles of trust. This is where we come together in a way that allows us to express our highest and true nature. He does these circles of trust all over the um, country um, as retreats. And then they develop into groups that meet periodically over a, of a period of time. And some of the stories that he tells in there are just uh, absolutely phenomenal, where people are, have le been leading a life where they feel so incongruent or so inauthentic. And then by being in the circles of trust, they actually listen, learn to listen to themselves, to their soul, to hear that still small voice that's making itself known when you are quiet enough to hear it. And then their lives change from that. He was telling the story of a man who worked for the Department of Agriculture. This man had grown up on a farm. He loved farming. He went to college to study ag agriculture. And instead of uh, going to work on his family farm, he decided to go to work into public service. And as he was doing the work, things were required of him that felt so out of integrity with the farmer's heart that he had. He was asked to approved, approve um, fertilizers and pesticides that he knew were harmful to the environment and to the planet. He was asked to make recommendations for things that he knew were not in the best interest of the harvest that was coming. He had to do all these things, and he felt so out of integrity and so incongruent within himself. His first inclination was to just quit. He couldn't stand it anymore. He couldn't, couldn't stand being working for the Department of Agriculture and feeling what he was feeling inside. But through the circle of trust, he learned to listen. And he learned to hear his farmer's heart. And then he had, because he heard it, he had the courage to take steps to actually change within the environment that he worked in, to begin to bring change into that environment. One of the things he quotes is, a, is a, Parker Palmer talks about is a, it was a big decision that was coming up about a specific pes pesticide. And he was on the forefront against it and was able to speak clearly about that because he learned to listen to his soul. And he tapped into that farmer's heart. That was the true nature of who he was and allowed it to come forth because he had the courage and the support of the community he had the clarity because he learned to listen to his own soul. And so he was able to shift in within the environment that he's in. So often, our tendency is to get out of a tough situation, to get out of it and to not have to deal with that. It's like, oh, that's too much. I don't, I don't want to mess with that. Um, I'd, rather, I'd rather go on and do something else than to do that. But it takes great courage and fortitude to stay in the situation where things are feeling inauthentic or incongruent within us and allow ourselves to be in that place of discomfort and work through it and allow some kind of change to come through for us in there. We all need an inner teacher to guide us. We all need to be able to hear that still small voice because that's what we rely on more than anything else than we can get from any kind of book that we would read, any kind of uh, teacher that we would follow, any kind of uh, work that we would do that's outside of ourselves. Learning to listen to that inner teacher is one of the most powerful things that we can do. And again, that is done when we're quiet, when we hear that still small voice. As uh, the master teacher said, it's when we be still and know. We be still and know what is true for ourselves, where are we are in alignment with um, our highest self, our highest nature. But then secondly, we need to invite other people in to in amplify and help us discern 
that small, still voice. And there are three reasons that Parker Palmer gives for this. He says, the journey in toward inner truth is too taxing to be made alone. If we are lacking support, then we soon become weary or fearful, and most likely we will just quit. If we don't have the outer support to go along with our inner teacher, then really sometimes the road just becomes too hard, and it's easy to take a different path. The second reason, he says, the path is too deeply hidden to be traveled without company. Finding our way involves clues that are subtle and sometimes misleading, requiring the kind of discernment that can only happen in dialogue with others. Sometimes we get wrapped up in our own small voice, and it puts us on a spin cycle. And it takes actually talking it out with someone else of high consciousness and allowing ourselves to actually discern what is true for me here. This is really helpful when we're in a group of people that we can trust or when we're working in a in a particular like a practitioner session or with a counselor or a coach. Having someone that we trust to help us discern what is true for us It's a very powerful practice. And the third reason, he says, the destination is too daunting to be achieved alone. We need community to find the courage to venture into alien lands to which the inner teacher has called us. By being with other people that we can trust, other people that we know got our back, it gives us a little bit more courage to take those steps forward. I know for myself, I've had a circle of of, um, what I call my peeps. And my peeps I know support me. And so it's allowed me to step into myself in a more authentic way because I didn't fear the rejection. I knew they held me high and that they too were looking for the unfoldment of my higher self, my true self. And they were excited and anxious and overjoyed to watch it happen. And so when we find ourselves in a community like that, when we begin to build a community for ourselves that allows us to have that support that we need, that our inner teacher, our inner voice needs to actually discern what is true for us and to give us the courage to take those steps forward, then life really begins to open in magnificent ways. This divided life that happens over time for us, it's a a wounded life. And it is a wound that wants to be healed. And so when we feel an urge to do something different, when we feel that urge to uh, take steps that we know might be challenging for us, but yet feels like it's the thing that's our next our next uh, step in our evolution, then having the courage that people, other people around us gives us is a way that we can begin to heal that for ourselves. You know, Ernest says that there's nothing to be healed, only the truth to be revealed. But sometimes these things feel like they're a wound. And we need to take steps to actually begin to eliminate that feeling so that we can actually see that hidden truth that's under there. We need to be able to take those steps and move forward in a way that leads us to that renewed sense of wholeness that we came in here to feel. You know, the, this practice of coming together in circles has been around since the beginning of time. As I said, humans weren't meant to be, to live in isolation. We were meant to live in community. And finding wisdom circles within our community has been one of the greatest practices that we could ever do. You know, here at Center for Spiritual Living Greater Las Vegas, we have what we call our sacred circles. And currently we have six of them. We have two of them that have been meeting for a long time. They are closed circles. And then we have four of them that um, are open to anyone to join them. And we are looking to create new circles as we open up our new building. We'll have space for people to meet, 
We, I, I, I envision, and along with the Leadership Council, envision our space being used all the time. We, what, we have a beautiful space that we are creating. It has um, three different rooms where people can meet, plus the big sanctuary. And so we have places for, for groups to come together to uh, begin to develop these circles of trust, these sacred circles that uh, allow us to explore and to deepen and to grow in ways that we might not have envisioned for ourselves. I know for me, when I came to Center for Spiritual Living, uh, the women's group, women's circle, was powerful for me. It was a place where I could come together and speak things that I had never said to anybody else, never even said out loud to myself. Because we developed a circle of trust there. We've developed a group of people that were willing to hear us willing to witness the evolution of our soul. We have our classes that also begin to develop into set a sacred circle of trust that we can actually begin to explore ideas, usually some kind of focused topic that we're working on for that particular class. And we explore these ideas in a safe environment. And by a safe environment, I mean it's one where we come into it and we don't feel judged. We feel like we can express who we are and not have anybody ridicule us or put us down or walk away from us. Just one of the worst things that can happen to ignore us or turn away. To actually just have a place where we can be who we are called to be. Where we can remember who we came here to be in the first place. So I'd like to take us into a little practice here to just see maybe what it is your soul might be calling you to, um, to explore for you. And then see if there's any kind of a circle that might come up for you in this exploration. To see if there's something that your soul is calling um, for you to um, study or to explore or to deepen in as we move about. We are always looking for ideas for new circles, and of course we are always looking for ideas of people who would be willing to help lead or co-lead cir uh, circles of trust. So uh, let's do this uh, little contemplation here. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, if you're comfortable with it, go ahead and close your eyes. I like to take in some nice deep centering breaths just to bring myself into my body so that I can feel that I am connected. Notice the chair that's supporting you right now. You are totally safe with your eyes closed. The chair has you fully supported. Your feet touching the ground, which connects you to the earth, tethering you. And just notice anything around you. You may hear the breathing of another person next to you, or the air conditioner. You may notice the light shining brighter on one side of your face than the other. Just begin to notice what's around you. As we center ourselves, turning within, And just like the way I described the soul before, it is that shy animal. But it might have something to say to you right now. One way to elicit this information is to ask questions with the intention of hearing an answer. And so, I invite you to ask yourself, to ask your higher self, your true self, your soul, what do I need right now to feel whole? What do I need to feel whole again?
what kind of support do I need to explore this idea that is going to make me feel whole? What kind of support do I need? Does this support need to be centered on a theme or a topic? Is there a particular affinity group that may come together as a circle? Something like a men's group or a women's group or elders group or a young adults group or mother's group? What kind of circle would support me best in being able to discern what is wanting to come through from my higher self? So just take in a nice deep breath. Notice what's happening around you. Feel that chair beneath you again. When you're ready, go ahead and open up your eyes. On the back table, I put a list, just a blank list, of possible groups. We would love to hear your ideas. We've done surveys before about this, but uh, this is a way of tapping into our soul and seeing what's yearning to come forth. And so if any idea came forth for you, it doesn't even matter whether you think it's something you want to do or you just think it's a good idea or somebody else should do it, there's a sheet back in the back there. Go ahead and put um, any of your ideas down there. And if you happen to be called to lead or co-lead one of these groups, you can add your name. Otherwise, you don't really have to. But this is an opportunity for us to begin to build some more of those sacred circles. These places where we are witnessed, where we are heard, where we are valued, and where our soul has an opportunity to let itself be seen in a way it might not have ever been seen before. This is a great opportunity we have as we are building this new community to create something special here that actually works towards the evolution of our souls. Because we know as we evolve individually, our entire community evolves and we become a huge blessing in any community that we're in. This is our world work that we have to do here, folks. This is what, what and why we are here, to uh, be that place of conscious connection with the wholeness that we came here to be and allow that to show forth you know, just like Marianne Williamson's quote, when I find my freedom, I give other people permission to do the same. When I find my truth, I give other people permission to live their truth. And that is a powerful experience. And it's a powerful mission for our new Center for Spiritual Living, Greater Las Vegas. All right, let's take this into prayer.
So we use our spiritual mind treatment, which is a form of affirmative prayer. We're not begging spirit for anything. We're not trying to barter. We're not trying to uh, make a deal here and see what happens. We are stating truth that we know. We begin by acknowledging the presence of the divine and all of its magnificence and glory. And we know that because we are one with it, that everything that that is is within us. We unify ourselves in consciousness. And then we state truth, give thanks, and let it go. All right, if you would turn within with me. I always pray with my eyes closed. If it helps for you, go ahead and do that. So turning within to that place in consciousness where the still small voice is heard. I know that there is only one. One power, one presence, one divine creative source of all. It goes by many names and shows up in many forms. I simply know it is God. That creative love intelligence that has brought forth everything into existence. I know it as a place of perfect peace and unconditional love. I know that it moves in balance and harmony throughout all the world, creating everything that has ever been and everything that is yet to be. Because I know there's only one, I know that I am one with it. That my life is a macrocosm of the great microcosm. I know that I am that perfect emanation of that love intelligence showing up right here and right now. And as I know this is true for me, I know this is true for each and every person. That we are all an individualized representation of the unique wholeness of the universe. I know that this wholeness is present in everything, in all life in each individual being, everything is in integrity, whole and undivided. I know that our work is to uncover that hidden wholeness and to allow it to burst forth perfectly and uniquely just as we were designed to do. I know that this connection we have with spirit that is heard so tangibly through that small, still voice is guiding and directing the way for our unfoldment and for the evolution of our own individual consciousness. I know that we are the divine incarnate and there is absolutely nothing missing within each and every one of us how good it is to know this how good it is to feel it how good it is to see itself expressing through everyone I meet and I just give thanks for this perfection and wholeness for the action and the activity of the divine. And I let it go. And I let it be. And together we say, and so it is.